introduce ourselves. Maybe Floor will be on. We are live. We are live. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Senator Jim Dill, chair of uh, IFMW committee. I want to welcome everybody here this morning to our committee meeting. And we have four work sessions scheduled for today. And then a couple of uh, language reviews after that. And uh, what we'll do is first, we'll go ahead and uh, introduce the committee. And I'll start with Representative Danny Martin. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Danny Martin, House 150, located in Northern Rooster County. Representative Alley. Good morning, Senator Dale. And I am on board. I'm from District 138, Jonesport, Beals, Addison, Cherryfield, Columbia, Columbia Falls, Centerville, Harrington, Jonesboro, Jonesport, Mill, Milford, uh, Marshfield, Millbridge, Whitneyville, and the township of Centerville. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Mason. Good morning. Thank you, Senator Dill. I'm Rick Mason, District 56 for the great people of Lisbon. Thank you. And before I continue, uh, uh, Linda, would you make sure you make me a host when you get a chance? Yes. Thank you. Representative Terrio. Thank you, Senator Dill. Good morning. My name is Tim Terrio. I uh, represent District 79, which is Albion, most of Benton, China, and Unity Plantation. Representative Landry. Uh, good morning, uh, Scott Landry. I live in Farmington and represent District 113, the towns of Farmington and New Sharon. And Representative Wardway. Good morning, Senator. Uh, Lester Ordway, I represent the great people of the town of Standish. Thank you. Good morning, Representative Hepler. Good morning, I'm Allison Hepler. I live in the lovely town of Woolwich and I represent um, the other the towns of not only Woolwich, but Arousic, Georgetown, Pittsburgh, Dresden, and part of Richmond. Good morning, Representative Netto. Good morning, thank you, Senator Dill. Kathy Netto here. I represent Winslow and a small portion of Benton. Thank you. On to good morning to Representative Leifert. Representative Leifert looks like it's possibly frozen. I will move on to Senator Curry. Good morning, Senator. Good morning. I'm uh, Senator Chip Curry. I represent Senate District 11, which includes uh, all of Waldo County. And I will come back to Representative Leifert uh, if he thaws out this morning. Even if it's supposed to get warm today. So um, this is a work session that we have going today. As I said, I think we have four of them scheduled. Um, and remember that uh, keep yourself muted until you're ready to uh, speak. Um, only committee members will be um, speaking unless we ask for someone else to come up and answer some questions for us. And uh, at that point in time, uh, the person will, can be questioned and again, only by committee members. Um, this is live stream. So remember you all, if you don't have your mic muted, you are hot and people can hear what you have to say. The chat box should be only for uh, a couple of technical things like if you're putting a website or if Representative Martin's putting his telephone number there or something where only the folks uh, um, here on the um, screen can see it. Uh, so if you have anything substantial to say, please say it uh, um, so that we all are apprised of uh, what we're going to do. If we take committee votes today, we will do them by roll call and the chair will announce um, the vote after the end of the roll call. And with that, I would introduce the clerk, Linda McCroy. And Linda will be the one running a whole operation here and keeping us uh, going. And we have Rachel Olson and John Clark here for analysts. And uh, they 
keep the notes and, and today where it's work session, they will be presenting a summary of our public hearings for us to have the information so that we can go ahead and vote. And with that, I will go ahead and open the work session on LD309, an act to require a non-resident to hire a licensed main guide to hunt big game. Okay, so, good morning. Good morning. Um, so this is the bill um, <clears throat> that prohibits a non-resident from hunting moose, deer, or bear without being accompanied by a licensed main guide. Um, and it provides a limited exception if the non-resident is from a US state or a province of Canada and uh, Maine has a reciprocity agreement with that state or province, and the reciprocity agreement allows Maine citizens to hunt without a guide, uh, moose, deer, or bear. Um, you have not got a fiscal note yet on this, but the department had indicated that there would be a fiscal impact, and, and part of that would be relating to administering these reciprocity agreements uh, with the various states and provinces. You had also asked uh, the department for information on um, big game hunting licenses for people from uh, Canada, and they provide you some numbers, um, 201, this was from the 2019 season, since there were no um, Canadians who came during the pandemic, but during 2019, 201 from Quebec, 96 from New Brunswick, 48 from Nova Scotia, 15 from Ontario, two from Prince, uh, Pres no, what's that? Prince Edward Island, um, one from British Columbia and one from the Yukon Territory. Um, there are some drafting issues associated with um, the bill. If you were to go forward with it, I can talk about those um, now or later. Um, and just a little background information. I think you heard about this during the public hearing. There was legislation enacted in 2007, which had prohibited all aliens, that is persons who are not citizens of the United States from hunting bear moose or deer without a guide, that law was repealed in 2009 uh, and replaced with a law that required a Canadian from New Brunswick or Quebec to have a license to hunt big game or wild turkey. There were uh, exceptions for persons who owned land in the state and met other requirements. That law was repealed in 2011. So that was the background on previous similar legislation. Are there any questions for Mr. Clark. Seeing none, could uh, Commissioner Camuso uh, unmute her mic and introduce herself, please? Good morning, everyone. I'm Judy Camuso, Commissioner of Maine Fish and Wildlife. Happy to be here with you all today. Good morning, Commissioner. Do you have a question for me? I, I, I kind of, yeah, I kind of do. Um, and I, and I guess it is, it almost sounds like we're coming back in a cycle here since some of this already was in place before and has since been repealed. And I was wondering if, if you knew any of the history of the reasons why they were repealed. Um, I mean, if it seems like such a good idea and then trying to do something similar again, but we've already had it repealed it, so. I don't know if you- Yeah, um, yeah. so, I think a couple of things, Senator, I can ask Tim Peabody to, he's in the waiting room. He might know a little bit more about the history of why it was repealed. I do know the last time, um, so I, I anticipate the fiscal note will be both sort of administrative costs, but also we did see a reduction in uh, people from uh, Canada in particular coming. So there would be a fiscal note and a loss of revenue as well. Um, and I think, you know, part of our concern is, is primarily dealing with the other states and having to establish those reciprocity agreements and, um, you know, sort of keeping track of what all the other states are doing and requiring and whether we need an agreement with that or not. So um, I see Deputy Commissioner Peabody is here. Uh, Tim, do you know more about the history of why it was sort of enacted and then repealed? Yeah, the, 
it was actually um, you, Tim. Would you introduce yourself, please? Uh, excuse, excuse me, I'm uh, Tim Peabody, Deputy Commissioner of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, the final time uh, was but was for a fiscal issue. Uh, it was enacted, then it was amended. I believe Mr. Clark said, and uh, the final time when it was repealed was for fiscal loan. Okay, great, thank you, uh, Representative Lifeman. Looks like Representative Lifeford is frozen again. Must be having some issues this morning. Are there other questions? Representative Danny Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the initial bill was enacted into law, uh, Deputy Commissioner Peabody, in 2007. I believe, and in 2009, uh, the law, the, the, the old law was, was uh, amended to require just uh, Canadian citizens. Is that not correct? That's correct, Representative Martin. And then, and then the whole thing was re further repealed in 2011. And you claim that that was based on uh, financial considerations and loss of revenues. Is that correct? Yes, I think it was about uh, $38,000 uh, fiscal note at that time. Thank you. Representative Leifid, are you available again? Well, Senator Dill, I'm in and out of this thing. It's terrible today up here. I don't know what's causing it. I'm in for about 10 seconds and then gone. So I just wanted you to know that I have no questions. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Hepler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a question that I uh, that seems to have come up during the public hearing. Um, what other what states require a guide for a specific hunt? Does any, uh, I don't know if that's a question for the department or. Yeah, I guess that would be a department question if they have that answer. I'm not sure they do, but. I think we can um, hopefully Director Webb was able to get into the meeting today, but there are a number of states that do require um, guides for a particular hunt. So some states like require it just for elk or, um, you know, uh, bear, but I don't know and if Nate is able to join us. Um, I think Nate has a better idea of how many states have some kind of requirement for for non-residents to, to hire guides. That's not quite uh, as, as clear as you might think. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? John Martin. Yeah, just, a just a comment, going back to the original intent of why it ended up became law. Uh, and it really was the result of problem on the border. Uh, and if, you've you know, if you go hunting uh, along the border, very often what you see are a number of people who come across from Quebec and then uh, they block the roads. Uh, and so you can't go down the road and there they are. I've, I've had a couple run-ins with a couple of them. My advantage, of course, I could speak French with them and told them where they should be going. Uh, and, and so that's how it ended up uh, being one of the reasons why I got, got to get in. The repeal occurred uh, primarily because Governor Page basically uh, was concerned that it was an affront to the Canadians if we had that. Okay. Thank you. Representative Ordway. I don't really, thank you, Senator. I really don't have a question. Uh, I have a comment and I am not opposed to this bill. I would suggest that we take out states in it and just leave Canada in it the way it was. Uh, turnabout is fair play. If, if, an, if an American citizen has to hire a guide in Canada, I have no qualms about having a Canadian citizen uh, with purpose for, how, yeah, you, you, whatever. But the, uh, I have no qualms about having them hire a guide. If I look at the numbers, I think it's only in the Brunswick that 
that would be effective and uh, turnabouts fair play, uh, only 96 licenses in 2019, I see. My two cents. I would tend to agree with that. And would you, uh, Representative Ordway, though, make the exception if they own land here that they wouldn't have to? I think that was one of those laws we had once before. Or would you just say blanket? Oh, uh, if they, if I would say that if they owned land here and paid taxes, I would make an exemption. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Danny Martin. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I tend to agree with uh, uh, Representative Ordway. You know, if we were if we were to go back, if we move forward with this piece of legislation, LD three hundred nine, and go back and and amended to what the law was in two thousand and nine. Uh, that would uh, decrease the financial impact of the department considerably, would it not, uh, Commissioner? Uh, thank you, Representative Martin. I, I think it would. I think we would want to look at some of the numbers, but I don't know off the top of my head. I, I, certainly, it would be less impactful if it was just Canada than for the states as well. So for sure, it would help. I would, if I might just suggest, if you're going to consider this, um, I would just ask, Colonel Scott had some questions on um, the language around hire a guide versus hunting in the presence of. So I think there was some, if we could bring Colonel Scott in, he had some recommended uh, changes so that we clarified what exactly was going to be required of the hunter, whether they just hired a guide, but to be in the presence of or hunting with. So there was some, I think, clarifications that might be helpful. Sure, we'll come back to him in a second. Representative, I mean, Senator Curry. Yes, I, thank you, Chair, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm, my question is to our analyst or, um, or, the, or the commissioner. I seem to recall that, that in testimony, it was believed that there is no other state that had a hunt, because we're talking about comparisons, um, uh, has the same hunt. You know, they've got a grizzly bear hunt, but 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 we don't have that, so it wouldn't apply. Is that your understanding of it as well? That 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 we would have no issue with any under current law, based on every other state's laws, that that there's no. Um, no resident of another state that would be required of this. Who well, has the answer? Um, Senator, yeah. sorry. I think my understanding is if there is a state that has a moose hunt where the non-residents are required to hire a guide to hunt moose, then we would also have that requirement for residents of that state. Our challenge would be, of course, keeping track of all of those requirements. <coughs> Um, species by species in the various states. And, and some states may, I don't know, I, I, I think uh, Director Webb is on in the waiting room now and he can probably answer this question. Um, there, there may be some states that just have a blanket uh, requirement for all non-residents, but that I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you, Representative Hepler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just was looking at my notes from the public hearing and um, Don Kleiner seemed to be opposed to this. Actually, what he said was they'd made real good efforts to increase the non the experiences of non-residents and didn't want to jeopardize that. I just want to throw that out there. All right, thank you. Representative Danny Martin. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I, think, I think what uh, Representative Ordway and I were suggesting that if in fact we move forward with this piece of legislation, it would omit uh, the states and just uh, deal with the Canadian provinces. So for Senator Curry, your question would be moot because the states would not be involved. Uh, and that's the direction that I, that I could support. Okay. Representative Ordway. That would definitely be my intent to, to remove the states. Uh, again, uh, right. my, my friend that the ex chief executive uh, didn't want to affront the Canadians. I don't care. Okay, before we move on, I will call on uh, Colonel Scott to introduce himself. 
Uh, good morning, uh, Dan Scott, Colonel with the Warden Service. Um, our only um, uh, notation really is uh, when this passed back in, I believe it was 2007 or nine, it spoke to the hiring of a guide um, and it really didn't give any parameters as to what that meant. And we did experience some um, non-resident alien or non-resident non-citizen hunters, uh, you know, basically paying someone to serve as their guide, even though they weren't really uh, in the presence of or accompanied by. This current language does speak to um, being accompanied by the guide. And I would just offer that um, we may want to define that similar to say with a subpermittee and a permittee that, you know, it can't require any enhancement of audio devices or binoculars or CV radios so that people understand that accompanied by the guide means that the guide must be must be present on the hunt. Um, so we don't run into situations like Representative Martin described with blocking of roads, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for the Colonel? Representative Hepler. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, Colonel Scott, has this been a I mean, I guess I'm wondering about the origins of this um, coming back. Is this been a problem in your experience on the on the border? Has which been a problem? The, the well, Canadians the, coming in and, and doing what Representative Martin was talking about, blocking roads. I mean, more recently. During, uh, if we're speaking directly towards moose hunting seasons, mostly um, we we have issues with both residents and non-residents typically blocking roads and we try to do outreach and work with the North Main Woods to, um, um, to alleviate some of those, uh, those situations because it is against the law. Um, however, Representative Martin does have an extensive amount of experience up there uh, right along the border. And I'm sure that if, if he indicates that that is activities occurring there um, from Canadians, it, it likely is. Are there any other questions for the Colonel? Saying none, our, oh, it's Representative Martin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, not a question, Mr. Chair, for the uh, Colonel. However, if there's interest in moving forward in some form or fashion, uh, it would be great if uh, John, um, our analyst, uh, could dig up uh, the statute uh, that occurred in 2009 and, and and, and just kind of digest that and see where that, that is and see if that would be something that uh, we could move forward with. And just on that note, uh, thank you, uh, Representative Martin. I, I was just gonna suggest, I, I actually have it and I can put it up on the screen if, you, if you'd like to look at it here and give you base, the basic sense of it. Sure. Okay. <clears throat> um, can I share, Linda? Yes, you should be able to. Okay. Do you see a green screen share button? Perhaps yeah. at the bottom. There you go. All right. Are, do, do you see that now? Yep. Okay. So that was the law that was um, enacted um, back in 2009. Um, it related to um, big game, uh, bear, moose, uh, and deer. Um, and it prohibited an alien from either New Brunswick or Quebec uh, from hunting big game or wild turkey without being accompanied by a person who holds a valid guide license. The exceptions were owning land in the state or leasing land in the state, current on property taxes, keeps the property uh, owned or leased in the state open for hunting by the public and while hunting uh, possesses written authorization from the commissioner to hunt um, without a guide. Um, so this, and then there was a penalty provision. So that was the what was in place back in 2009. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Uh, Representative Martin, are you, do you have any questions now that you see this? Uh, no, no. I. Uh... Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I was on board with the department when in 2009 when this, this was done. And uh, that was uh, as a result of a compromise that was reached. And uh, I'm not sure where the department stood at the time, but I remember discussing this and working with uh, uh, 
uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Peabody at the time. But that's 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 something that I could uh, clearly support. I, I guess my only question <laughs> is, why would we limit it to New Brunswick or Quebec? I realize that's where most of them come from, but still, that seems like we're really, um, you know, being very selective. Why wouldn't it be any Canadian province? Well, this is John Martin. That's where the problem exists. It doesn't exist with the other provinces <laughs> at all. Yeah, and I, and I understand that, Representative Martin. But I'm, but I'm just, and I, I assume that it, it's probably a problem with them because of um, their proximity, of you know, going back and forth across the border. But all I'm saying is, if we do this, why wouldn't it be all Canadian provinces? I, I hear you saying there's probably only one or two or maybe a half a dozen licenses from other Canadian provinces, and the problem is because of the proximity. But I, I yeah. just, I guess I just have a problem kind of singling out provinces. That would be like saying here in the U.S., well, you know, we got problems with people from Massachusetts and New York, so, you know, they would need a guide, and the rest of the states don't. Yeah, if I, if I may, Mr. Chair, respond to, to your, your question. Uh, yes. Frankly, uh, if we were to include the states, the financial impact of the department would, I, yeah. would be much greater. And I, I quite frankly, I, I, I haven't polled the committee, but I'm not sure there'd be support uh, to, uh, to if we were to... I think I think we could garnish some support on 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 this piece of legislation that was enacted in 2009. But clearly, I think we'd have a, a much divided report if we included the states and others. Right. I know. And I, I wasn't in, I, I wasn't suggesting at all that we include the states. Right. I, I, my only question is singling out two provinces in Canada part. And I was just trying to make a, an analogy that you know, would we do that in if we were including states that we would just pick out two states right. of the 50 and say those are ones because they're fairly close by and we get people from them, they're the problems. So they would have to have a guy, but no other state would. That's that's my only question. Right. I, I guess maybe I'm questioning the legality of I, I realize we can make a law to do anything we want. Um, but um, anyway, uh, Representative Terrio. Thank you, Senator. Um, I'm curious of why don't we just say any foreigner? I mean, that covers all of Canada and it covers any foreign country because I wouldn't think we'd want any foreign country to come in here and be able to hunt either without a guide. Sure. Would that be foreigner or non-citizen, I guess? Non-citizen. There you go. Non-citizen. Okay. Non-U.S. Non-U.S. Okay. Uh, Representative uh, Ordway. Yeah, to, to your point, uh, Senator Dill, I have no problem with it being all of Canada. Okay, thank you, sir. None. Uh, Senator Curry. Thank you. Um, it seems to me that the central point of this question is to, is to have fair play with the, um, the, the, provinces and or foreign countries that require the same of our of our um, residents and so I would be I, I'd like that to be in the language that we're that rather than identifying them specifically we're, we're saying you know if you're going to treat our our hunters this way in your territory we will treat your hunters this way um, here I I like that otherwise it feels as as Senator Dill was was saying, you know, targeted in a way that that uh, um, just makes us sound like we're unwelcoming, and really this is a message of fair play, trying to influence those provinces to treat our hunters better. Correct. I would think so, and I think that's what Representative Ordway was getting at when he made his motion. I, I think originally he probably said Canada, but I'm not. Sure. I think I'd agree with that. Okay. Uh, Representative uh, Hepler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I'm not sure I need to, uh, when we were talking about citizens, if we're going back to Canadians, um, non-citizen would not include people who are legally here or would include people who are legally here or have, you know, are working and whatnot. And I'd be uncomfortable using the term non-citizen. 
So you're back to Canadian. I'm yeah. still maybe uh, um, if I can, oops, yeah, if I can follow up um, with Representative John Martin when you indicated that there was an issue back in 2009. Is there is there still an issue today? I guess is my question. There will that that not at the moment, but there will be this fall once the season starts, and and it happens. You know, even though we just don't have enough, we law enforcement who can spend a lot of time on the border. They got other areas to serve. All right. So what do we have for suggestions? Representative Martin, I, Danny Martin, I believe you had made a suggestion earlier about taking it and doing something with language. Was that correct? Or do I misremember that? Well, a good starting point was is what we have before the screen, uh, yep. but I certainly would not be opposed to uh, anything that'll work, whether we right. include the verb is non-citizen or whether we go with what Representative Lord uh, Ordway is suggesting or Representative John Martin. I suppose you can do what it says right there. It says uh, prohibits an alien resident of the Canadian provinces may not hunt if that's, and then leave it basically like that the rest of the way. Representative Ordway. Yeah, and I would include it, it with that. I'm, I'm going to make a motion of ought to pass with that language of Canadian citizens and must be accompanied with and in the presence of in the wording. Okay. Is there a second for that? Seconded by Representative Al. Representative Netto. I'm sorry, I can't unmute here. Yeah. Oh, shoot. You're good. You're good. Oh, there we go. Right. Um, didn't someone say in the in the uh, meeting that they had someone from France that came over to hunt? I'm just wondering, I mean, if we're going to just target Canadians and not people from France or wherever it's probably because again of proximity to canada that they do come here to hunt whereas i would guess and i, I guess we could go back to the uh commissioner and ask her how many if she knows off the top of her head or has seen how many other foreign country nationalists may actually have licenses in the state of maine to hunt big game yeah, thank you, Senator. We do have some every year uh, from European countries that in particular that come here and hunt. It is, of course, much more limited. And I think um, the issue is really not with those, uh, you know, those tourists as a, you know, because they, they don't have particular vehicles that they're blocking access. So I think the issue, as far as I understand it anyway, is as of Representative Martin indicated and in, with the, you know, the area right along the border is the concern. I think I, I don't know of any concerns with other um, foreign nationals uh, participating in our activity. I, we can certainly get you the list of the, the countries and the total number of licenses we sell if that is of interest. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Netto, did you still have a question? No, I do not. Okay. Um, Representative Hepler. You muted it, Representative. There we go. Um, I'm using too many screens here. So the question that um, Senator Curry raised was about um, reciprocity. And so I guess the, the question is, apparently, according to my notes, New Brunswick requires a guide for everything. Is that the same in other Canadian provinces? And would using language more about reciprocity be more difficult to, um, for the department to maintain than just Canadians? I see you nodding your head. Who cares to answer the question if the, anyone can? Yes, thank you, Representative 
that we, we really do not want to get into the administrative burden of tracking which state or provinces allow or require what. So uh, a, a clear, you know, a clear yes or no, you know, by province is, is much easier for us to administer than um, having to track the reciprocity and if their rules change over time. Representative Ordway. Yeah, I would just state that, um, thank you, Senator. Uh, I don't see other foreign countries as an issue at this time. Uh, I, don't, I don't see somebody coming here from France and not hiring a guide. Uh, I think they, they'd be, we, the ones would still be looking for them. Uh, but no, I, limited to Canada, I, I, don't, I don't see as far, other foreign countries being a problem at all. Um, Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm a little concerned around, I think, what what the proposed motion was speaking of citizens of Canada, and, and I, I'm looking at the language here that says an alien resident of, Can of, of Canada, and I just don't understand, um, are we sweeping up too few people when we say citizens of Canada versus an alien resident? I know that was the prior language, uh, an alien resident of, Can of a Canadian province. I'm wondering if that might be better. Representative Ordway. I have no problem making that into my motion. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Representative Danny Martin. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what we have before the screen limits it to uh, the provinces of New Brunswick or Quebec, correct? The way it is there, but Representative Ordway did say I did say that he was willing to say provinces, Canadian provinces, and take out okay. New Brunswick and Quebec. All right. So, so if I may, Mr. Chair, so so Representative Ordway, what are we dealing with there? New Brunswick, Quebec, or Canadian provinces? I I said uh, Canadian provinces. I thought that uh, Senator Dill had an issue with it not being all. Okay. Um, I, I realize that our, our issues right now are mostly with uh, problems with uh, Quebecois and uh, the Brunswick. way they hunt and block the road and the repressivity of uh, New Brunswick. Those, those are my issues. I, I have no problem going either way. Uh, yeah, turn yes. about fair play. Right. I, 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 yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My only point of, uh, you know, if we limit it to New Brunswick and Quebec, uh, the odds are that uh, that would decrease the financial impact considerably and, and make it more attractive. Other questions, comments, discussion? Senator Curry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Do the other provinces also have the same um, requirement? Commissioner, do you know if citizens of Maine went to hunt in any other Canadian province, would they have to hire a guide for big game? Yeah, I'm not sure. And if we could have Director Webb brought in, um, he c can answer these questions. He can answer that, okay. He's been kicked out. He's been kicked out a few times already. Uh, so he's, yeah, you know, he's, know he's, he's rowdy, so we have to kick him out, you know. Actually, I am not seeing him in the... Uh, attendees no and All i right, sent him another link kicked out again if he needs another link i can send another link i'll try doing that that would be great thank you linda i do know the people who go to hunt in northern quebec need to have a guide required mm -hmm. yeah quebec and new brunswick probably i think is what somebody said that you did have to have a guide but um the saskatchewan uh, does too Representative uh, Mason. Yes, I know for a fact that you don't need a guide in Ontario. You do not? Okay. No. no. So then it is not all Canadian provinces. Okay. All right. The link has been sent. Um, yep. I'll, I'll watch for them. We'll just watch for him. Either. Yes, Representative Ordway. Yeah, if, if there's no objections, uh, and we can make this work. I'll gladly amend it to say New Brunswick and Quebec. Which is the language that's already there. And Which is the language, yes, yes. 
I'm good. I'm ve I'm good with that language. That's where our issues are. Okay. So that's your final answer. Representative. I Adams. certainly hope so. <laughs> Mr. Chair, if, if, yes. if we now have a new motion before us, uh, the committee member that seconded it. Which is Rep Representative Alley. Are you okay with that, Representative Alley? I am. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Can I just make, make sure I'm clear um, before the vote? Yep. Um, so this includes wild turkey, and I'm assuming that because the original bill was just big game. Uh, do you want to include the wild turkey in the was it what was in the law before? Um, and I just want to make sure that the intent is to keep that in. I would go back to Representative Ordway and see if that's his intent. I, I would keep wild turkey in it. Wild, wild okay. turkey is big game to me. Okay. Okay. Any other? Further discussion? Before we do, I will make an exception and I would ask to let in Don Kleiner as a guide from the main guides and Nathan Webb is now here. So first off, I'll go with uh, Nathan Webb. Good morning, Nate. Good morning, Senator Dill, Nate Webb, Wildlife Director. Uh, happy to answer any questions that I can. I think the big question, but may have been answered, but since you've been in and out, we thought we'd uh, stop making you a yo-yo and ask you a question at least. And that question is, um, do all or at least most uh, providences in Canada um, make um, you hire a guide if you're from, say, Maine, going to hunt in their province for big game? Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm having some technical issues. I, I believe your question was about the requirements to hire a... Yeah, in, in Canadian provinces, in most Canadian provinces do... Guide. Um, do you have to hire a guide to hunt there? If you're out of state. Um, it, um, it does. Yeah, um, okay, thank you. It, it does vary quite a bit. There are a number of provinces that do require any non-resident alien so which would include anyone from the u.s to hire a guide but that's not universal it does vary quite a bit from province to province thank you uh, and we've kind of narrowed the scope of the bill anyway so um and don kleiner from a guide standpoint do you see any issues here thank you senator dill uh don kleiner Maine professional guides association uh, my biggest concern i believe this language will do uh, a company so that there's no uh, slop in the law like Dan Scott pointed out that it's clear that they can't just hire a guide who's then sitting back in camp that guide is actually guiding um, and also you've narrowed the scope considerably so many of my concerns in terms of non-residents from other states disappear. Okay, thank you. And, and I will mention that I, in fact, do frequently guide Europeans. And I would put it this way, those folks are not going to come here to hunt alone. They've, the expense is so high to start with, uh, simply to bring a firearm into this country, that they are, they're on a guided hunt anyway. Right. Okay, thank you. And I believe uh, Representative Audway did make it clear that it was accompanied by and in the presence of or something yes. to that effect. Yeah. Um, so it was clarified as to what uh, Colonel Scott had said too. So I, I believe that's in there. Any further discussion before I ask for a roll call? Seeing none, Linda, would you please call the roll? I will, starting with uh, Representative Lyford. Representative Lyford? We'll have to try to come back to him, as he said, okay. he's having difficulty, he's frozen at the moment, so. Yeah, there's some difficulties this morning. Uh, Representative Mason. Representative Mason. Has he left us? No, he's here. He's here, but there he is. Nope, there he Okay, is. there we are. And you need to unmute, sir. There we go. I believe yes. And I'll it's go not back. The path is amended, right? Uh, and I'll go back to uh, Representative Lyford. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll vote yes. Senator Dell, did you get my message that I'm in and out on this internet? Yes, I did. Okay, thank thanks. Yeah, there are issues this morning. Uh, Representative Hepler. Yes. Senator Curry. Yes. Senator Black. Yes. Senator Dill. Yes. Representative Landry. Yes. Representative Terrio. Yes. Representative Danny Martin. Yes. Representative Ordway. Yes. Representative Alley. Yes. Representative Nedu. Yes. And Representative John Martin. Yes. That's unanimous 13 in favor. 13 to zero on ought to pass as amended on LB 309, an act requiring non resident to hire a licensed main guide to hunt big game. I will end the work session on LB 309 and I'll open up the work session on LB 349, an act to prohibit the use of personal watercraft on Kai's Pond in the town of Sweden. And I will turn back to John Clark. So this bill um, is uh, a bill to add uh, Kai's Pond in the town of Sweden to the list of water bodies in the state in which the operation of personal watercraft is prohibited. Um, you heard during the public hearing some of the history on this. Uh, the Great Ponds Task Force back in the 1990s has set up a process whereby municipalities could submit recommendations to the state for the use, operation, and type of watercraft on Great Ponds. And at first gave the municipalities until 1998, and then again, uh, it was extended to 2000, and then finally 2001 for the municipalities to give their recommendations to the department. The department then uh, submitted its recommendations based on those recommendations to the legislature. I believe the last report from that series of processes uh, was uh, in 20, um, 2002, I think. Um, the uh, first list that was put in statute uh, was uh, in 1999. And then that list was expanded through that next uh, iteration. Um, and then the last expansion through the last iteration of that was in 2001. Um, subsequent to that process, there were two further ponds that were added by the legislature both in 2003, Indian Pond uh, and Lake St. George. And since 2003, uh, there have not been uh, that I could find any uh, additional ponds added to that list. Um, there are a number of ponds that are also listed uh, through the Land Use Planning Commission rules for the unorganized territories. That's a separate list, uh, separate from the municipal uh, list that's in statute. Um, and as you know, GIFNW has current authority to regulate watercraft um, through rulemaking, um, although that's somewhat limited. Uh, that relates to use and operation of watercraft to ensure safety of persons and property and horsepower limitations. Um, and that's essentially what I have on that one. All right, thank you. Are there any questions for John? I do have a question. I Yes, anyone know the his, yeah anyone know the history of why the legislature stopped the process of letting people go directly to the department to get this resolved and then it resulted now in people have to come to the legislature before that it seemed to be the process that worked fairly well commissioner do you have a our director peabody do you have an answer to that at the time uh, there was um, John Clark just spoke about the department acted as a pass through and if they met all the requirements set forth by the legislature and the great bonds task force we did not uh, hold anything back and, uh, and then the legislature basically did away with that process and, and kept the authority so then, go ahead John uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wonder, is there a reason why that happened is, is, or was it just the whim of a legislator? It's 
a good question if you're asking <laughs> me something <about> <laughs> to me that it would be so much easier if that process were in place and and people had an opportunity to get it done that way rather than having come to the legislature and what do i know about that community and the local area and whatever i mean it's not something why you know why would i want to be voting on it so are you suggesting suggesting representative martin that we change I, I am the flavor of this bill yeah, I, I would suggest that we get a draft of what the law used to be and, and see whether we go back to it. All right. Representative Danny Martin. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. It, it's interesting to note under the current law that no uh, body of water has been added or, or increased since the year 2003. Now, the concern that I would have with the bill as it's currently drafted is that the town of the town of Sweden, I believe, uh, the question would be to uh, maybe the sponsor of the bill or the department, has the town uh, approved this? Because under the current law, it seems to me that the town would have to ratify before coming to the legislature. Now, clearly, uh, as is the case with other, uh, other jurisdictions, watercrafts, for example, or boats, uh, it would be much simpler if the department were given the authority to approve this. That way, through the rulemaking, they could set up a process and ensure that before coming to the department, uh, that the community or the unorganized territory through the county commissioners would have a say in this. Because right now, we have no idea, as far as I'm concerned, whether or not the town of Sweden, uh, through their council or through their town meeting, uh, has approved this. Thank you, Representative Martin. So I think I heard a question to you from you to Representative uh, Sawin Millet, yes. perhaps. So yes. Representative Millet, if you'd uh, unmute yourself, please. Good Thank morning. You, uh, Senator Dill and Representative uh, Landry and members of the committee. Uh, the Introduce yourself first, please. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm Representative Sowen Millet from House District 71, which includes the town of Sweden. Uh, and I'm the sponsor of the bill. And to Representative Danny Martin, I will confess that I did not know the process. Therefore, the town uh, was not in, in compliance with the, the law that existed in the late 90s and early 2000s. I was here as you were commissioner then, Danny, um, in 2003 and remembered vaguely the Lake St. George um, admission to the list. However, I'll take full responsibility for not having gone through the process that was established back in the 90s. Um, since the hearing on the 22nd, uh, Andrew Black, who was in the waiting list, and Monica Bigley, and other lady, another lady from Sweden who have been very involved with the town, immediately went to the select board and said, can we get this question on the annual town meeting? This being late February, it was just a few days too late to get it on the warrant. But uh, we certainly do not intend, nor did we intend to bypass an established process. It is my understanding that there's been a certain amount of vagueness about the process since 2003. However, we would like to work with you and hope that you would not dismiss the law as, as ill-timed or out of sync with the process because we simply were not aware of it. Um, we would like to see you think about, um, as Representative John Martin mentioned, a simpler process. However, if you stay with the current process, we are more than willing to have the town of Sweden weigh in on uh, approval, um, either in advance or possibly even retroactively if you were to amend the bill to provide a delayed effective date pending uh, a yes vote and majority by the town. We would love that and would work uh, certainly with the department to make that happen. At the very least, I would hope that if you are gonna change the law, you carry the bill forward and allow us to seek that approval if necessary uh, during the second regular session. But we, we do wanna cooperate and we certainly were not attempting to backdoor you. Uh, we simply were unaware of the process. Thank you. I think 
Representative Danny Martin's suggestion of yeah. perhaps tabling this and getting more information may be the way to go, but Representative Danny well, Martin. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Millett. Uh, as you know, the department has the authority through rulemaking and through the APA uh, to move forward on certain issues requiring, regarding uh, water issues like water crafts and boat size, horsepower size and all that. Wouldn't it be great if we could amend this bill to uh, allow these issues to go through rulemaking and directly to the department? Because like uh, Representative John Martin mentioned, what do we know about a water you know, water issue in, in Southern Maine or Northern Maine. So I, I, I think that would be the right approach to use. Okay. Representative Audway. Yeah, I, I would basically echo everything that Representative Danny Martin said uh, and uh, go, but want to make sure that, you know, people are coming to us and, and, and cherry picking ponds and, and, and lakefront owners uh, that if they went through the department, it would have to be through the, uh, the municipal officer yeah. uh, request and not just individual uh, lakefront owners. Uh, it, it just, it, as much as we don't like to have to cherry pick these, I'm sure they don't have time to do it. Right. Tim Peabody, where are you, where do you think the department is on this issue at the moment. Um. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my memory starting to come back in line here because I was Colonel at the time and I, the committee uh, was very concerned about the enforcement process at the time. So they basically, the towns had to have go through the town meetings and then they had to demonstrate that they had some enforcement ability to enforce the law on their particular body of water through an inland harbor master. I believe the inland harbor master language was put in law at around that time period also. So um, if the committee uh, moves forward here, that uh, because of the fiscal impact on the department, it'll have to be clear in the process. If it's a rulemaking process, what our ability would be to uh, deal with any increase in enforcement that would be required having a personal watercraft uh, prohibition. Chairman. Yes. I wonder if we could have the department uh, take a look at it and see what the language was and whether or not that makes sense and bring it back to us. Sure. Let me just finish here with the hands that are up. So let me ask Commissioner Camuso if that's um, a good process to go through and you echo what uh, Mr. Peabody, Colonel Peabody said, Director Peabody. Uh, thank you, Senator Doe. Um, and I was actually looking for clarification. Is the committee looking to give the department the authority for rulemaking um, at the request of a municipality or unorganized uh, commission to ban personal watercraft or any particular kind of watercraft. So we, as you know, have had a number of issues with uh, other sorts of water watercraft. And so I'm just looking for clarity as to sure. uh, what you're proposing right now. Rep I'd go this back is to a, this big kettle of worms here that complicated quickly. Sure. I'd go rep back to Representative John Martin who just made that suggestion. I'm suggesting we take a look at both and okay. then decide, but let's see what the, yeah, how the department got, structure it. Sure, we got some more hands here. Representative Hepler. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I just want I, the conversation sort of moved around since I last put my hand up, but I just want to make sure that towns, of course, do have a say in um, and that the impetus would come from um, the town government. Right. Thank you. That's the way the old structure used to work. Yeah. Sounds like it. Senator Curry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the other thing I would ask if if the department could look at um, if we're going to change this to not have a deadline, that, that, that this would just be an ongoing process, we'd also have to look at how often an issue can be returned, you know, in terms of if, if something is brought forward and fails, can they bring it back the following year or is there a wait? 
um, just to, if it's an ongoing process or if it's a process that, that is always available. Mr. Chairman, I would move it be table for two weeks and let the department come back to us. Before I ask for a second, I still have two hands up. Representative Danny Martin. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to the commissioner, uh, the commissioner, you have the authority through rulemaking to limit horsepower size on lakes and ponds, correct? Is that correct? That is correct. All right. So, so if in fact, if in fact we table this bill, uh, you could probably use that format and come back to us, because. The, the rulemaking and the authority given you to limit horsepower size would work quite well with this piece of legislation here regarding uh, watercraft issues. And finally, Representative Ordway. Yeah, I got a feeling we're rushing here. I think with this, even two weeks, uh, in my opinion, we're putting too much on the department to, to try to come up with this in two weeks. I, I think we're confusing the issue that we have in front of us. Uh, and this needs a, a, some work. And I think the department should have some time to work this out. So, uh, and I don't think two weeks is enough. Okay, I, I just let the center of the department is looking back to us when they, they're ready. Yeah, I, yeah. All right, so I'll go back to Representative John Martin and his motion is to table this bill and ask the department to work on it, correct? Right, without a time period. Okay. So is there a second to tabling? Representative Landry. All in favor, just a show of hands. Looks like it's unanimous. Thank you all. Okay, next I will close the uh, work session on LD349 and open up the work session on LD356, an act to increase opportunities for seniors and persons with disabilities to participate in moose hunting. And we will go back to John Clark. So this bill uh, requires a moose permit to be issued on an application and payment of the permit fee, but not through the lottery uh, to a resident 70 years of age or older or a person with a disability uh, as defined in the Americans with Disability uh, Act. Um, the uh, there was a, a number of uh, pieces here. Um, there was reference to uh, what might be um, available currently for uh, people who are older. Uh, there is a provision in law now for people who are over 65 um, to get a permit if they've accumulated 30 points um, under the, the lottery system. There's also the department had provided information on the Make-A-Wish uh, program uh, that they have. I think they provided that information to the committee um, and also on the disabled veteran hunt. Um, the, uh, my understanding is with regard to the uh, Make-A-Wish uh, program, uh, they have a program where uh, they can issue two moose permits uh, to a nonprofit organization. And I think there are two organizations that the department's now working with where they do that. Um, and there's also this uh, rule chapter 16 where the department provides uh, a controlled moose hunt, which they call the broccoli hunt. I, I, I believe that's relating to the broccoli farming area um, that, that, uh, is, that takes place in and uh, up to, I believe, 30 moose uh, permits are issued there to disabled veterans. Um, and uh, there's a controlled hunt there for, for moose. Um, so those are the current, oh, actually there's one other provision, I believe, uh, that allows a uh, moose permit to be transferred to a disabled veteran um, who is more than 50% uh, service related uh, disabled. Um, so that's an additional uh, ability for a disabled veteran to get a moose permit. So those are the various pieces which are uh, available currently for um, older residents, uh, for uh, disabled veterans, and through the Make-A-Wish -Wish program for, that's for um, children under 21 years of age who have life-threatening or critical or terminal illnesses. 
Um, that was um, most of what I, you did hear, obviously at the hearing, the concerns about um, the number of people who are 70 years of age or older and how that would um, basically use up the number of moose permits that are currently uh, available. I think that's everything that I had. Uh, okay, thank you. Are there any questions for John? Seeing none, I would turn to Bill Swan and ask him to introduce himself, please. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. I'm Bill Swan, Director of Licensing here at Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, welcome to you this morning. Um, kind of a question for you. If we were to um, pass this bill, do you think this would pretty much take away all moose permits or a, a super percentage of them or, or, or where would that sit? I, you know, with people 70 years and older that now hold a big game license, not to mention the disability aspect. Right, it would certainly consume all of the permits that we currently give out. Um, and basically you'd be running a lottery with just those folks in it. Okay. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions for Mr. Swan? All right, seeing none, is there anyone else that anyone needs to hear from? All right, someone wanna make a motion? Representative Ordway. I would make a motion of ought not to pass. Motion of ought not to pass. Is there a second? I'll second it. It is seconded by Representative Mason. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, Linda, would you please call the roll? Yes, I'll start with uh, Representative John Martin. Representative John Martin is not there. We'll go back to the other end of the horseshoe then. Representative Lyford. Is Representative Lyford able to? Um, I don't, <laughs> okay. I actually don't see him. Yeah, he's on the bottom here, hold it. He's, he's there now. I think he may, no, he's not frozen. Representative Lyford, can you hear us? Yes, I can now. Um, can I say on the last bill, I would like to vote yes. Yeah. That would be on the. Uh, tabling. That was uh, on Kai's pond. You go, yes. You, yeah. Okay. Yes. Sure. No problem there with tabled anyway. And this is an ought um, not to pass to you. Friggin thing. <laughs> <laughs> ought not to pass. Representative Lyford, can you hear me? He's frozen again. I guess he's frozen again. All right. Okay. I'll, um, I'll continue on and we'll come back. Yes, please. Representative Mason. Yes. Representative Hepler. Yes. Representative Curry. I'm sorry, Senator Curry. Yes. Senator Black. Yes. Senator Dill. Yes. Representative Landry. Yes. Representative Terrio. Yes. Representative Danny Martin. Yes. Representative Ordway. Yes. Representative Alley. Yes, but I have a question. Uh, that make a wish and disabled veterans, they're already approved, right? Yes. Well, this bill here is one that I put together because I had a bunch of old uh, hunters and people that were disabled that thought they might want to try a lottery. So, I guess by the reading that there's probably already a lottery in, in effect. There is. Although, yes. Okay. Representative Nedu. Yes. Representative John Martin. Yes. And we'll go back to Representative Lyford. <clears throat> is he unfrozen? He was. Representative Lyford, can you hear us now? Looks like he's frozen again. It looks like he froze up just as we said that. He was moving and now he's not. All right. Okay. What was the count, Linda? Uh, well, that makes it without uh, Representative Lyford 11 in favor of ought not to pass. 
Okay, so ought not to pass 11 to 0 to 2. Um, goes on and down as ought not to pass. And I will close the work session on, before I do, ask Representative Ordway if he has a comment on this before I close the work session. Not on, the, not on this. I was just going to ask if Representative Life and how he feels about broadband funding now. <laughs> okay, I will close the work session on LD356. And I'll open up the work session on LD361, an act to establish a permanent appointment of a member of the Wabanaki tribes to the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Advisory Council. And I will go back to John. So this bill uh, increases the membership of the Advisory Council. It's currently 10 members and it adds an 11th member um, who represents the Wabanaki tribes. The governor would appoint this member uh, and the appointment would be based on the recommendations of the tribal governments of the Wabanaki tribes, which would include the Micmacs, uh, the Aroostook Band of uh, Maliseet Indians, Passamaquoddy Tribe at Indian Township, Passamaquoddy Tribe at Pleasant Point and the Penobscot Nation. Uh, the tribes would establish a process that provides for the membership to rotate among the tribal governments um, and I would note uh, the current law provides uh, appointed members may only serve uh, two consecutive terms. And I believe that provision in current law would apply to this uh, member from the Wabanaki tribes as well. Um, the current membership of the council, uh, the 10 members represent uh, the 16 counties, but it's not one-to-one. Uh, Androscoggin, and Kennebec, and Sagatahawk uh, have one representative. Franklin and Oxford have one representative. Knox, Lincoln, and Waldo have one representative. And Piscataquis and, and Somerset have one representative. Uh, and the other counties uh, have a representative per county. Um, there are uh, several provisions in current law which are similar to this. The Criminal Justice Academy has a provision for a very similar uh, position uh, representing the tribes. Um, the Commission on Domestic and Sexual Abuse has a provision for tribal representatives set up somewhat differently, but essentially the same idea. Uh, and the Permanent Commission on the Status of Racial, uh, Indigenous and Maine Tribal Populations has a provi uh, provision for a uh, tribal representative as well. And there are two, I believe, similar bills that are currently in other committees uh, one um, in the Marine Resources Committee, uh, which relates to the Marine Resources Advisory Council. And then there's also one in the Education Committee. It relates to the Board of Trustees uh, for the University of Maine system. Um, the final thing uh, that I would know that I believe the department had indicated um, support for this, but had indicated uh, a question about whether the tribal governments uh, would be working with in consultation with the commissioner when putting forth recommendations for the member uh, to the governor. Um, and I would let the commissioner fill that out further, uh, but I believe that was a, a comment or suggestion for perhaps a, a change there. Okay, we'll come to the commissioner in a minute. Are there any questions for uh, John? Saying none, I'll come back, commissioner. I haven't seen you in a long time, so would you uh, comment, please, on what John just mentioned? Thank you, Senator Dill. Um, and yes, John is correct. And the way the other 11 seats in our advisory council work is that I make recommendations uh, to the governor's office for appointment. Um, and then she and I meet or with her, meet with a member of her staff and make the, she will make the final recommendation based on a, a selection of recommendations. So my request was that this, uh, this seat work much the same that I would work with the tribal representations and together we would put forward two or three recommendations uh, for the governor to consider. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions for the commissioner? Seeing none. I'd call on Representative Newell to introduce herself and see if there's questions. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Rena Newell. I am the Passamaquoddy Tribal Representative for the Passamaquoddy Tribe. Thanks for having me this morning. My, my first question is, do you see any problem with what the commissioner just suggested, working with uh, um, the tribes to come up with two or three names to move forward to the governor? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, for, um, for the question and to the commissioner as well. I just wanna bring to the committee's attention um, some revised language that came from the attorney general's office. So we do have um, a representative from the attorney general's office if uh, she could speak to the proposed language. Sure. The language came out uh, just maybe a couple sent to the committee clerks maybe an hour and a half ago, but the language actually came out Friday evening. All right, great, thank you. Thank you. And we'll turn it over to the Assistant Attorney General, have her introduce herself. Good morning, Senator Dale, Representative Landry, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Kimberly Pat Warden. I'm an Assistant Attorney General. Um, I, I'm not sure if any of you have seen this language, um, if, if the analyst has been, okay. I've seen so, it. So I'm, I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads. Well, the analyst told us it was available, but I don't think anybody's had a chance to look at it. Okay, so I can do one of two things. I could, I think I'm allowed to, I could share my screen and bring it up with you so you can look it over. Would that, would that be helpful? Um, I'm not sure you can share your screen, but perhaps either John or Rachel could. Is that correct, John? Uh, I don't think I've got this, so I okay. can't. Share it. Um, Rachel, do you have it? I do. Uh, John, we got it in an email while we were in committee, um, but I do uh, have it. Would you like me to pull it up or John, do you want to do it? Uh, if you could pull it up, that'd be great. Sure, just one moment. Let me <clears throat> dig it out of the email. Um, okay, um, I have to apologize. I, I just was following along in the email. Uh, this is John's um, bill, so I, I haven't read this closely, but um, here it is. Okay, thank you. We will turn back to Kimberly. Um, thank you, Rachel. Uh, so you, you can see here that there's just a couple of changes, and these are the exact same changes that were just recently proposed to the similar bill in the uh, education committee and the education committee passed this language as a um, as amended um, just a couple of hours ago. Um, so it, it changes the language Wabanaki tribes to uh, a federally recognized Indian nation tribe or band in Maine. Uh, Wabanaki tribes is is not defined in Maine law, um, and our understanding was the purpose was that the, the member was to be a member of one of the four main tribes. So this, this clarifies that only the, the member on the advisory council has to be a member of these four tribes. Um, and then it also um, amends the language about how the recommendation is made to uh, the governor's office. Um, and that is because um, it, it was the view of the office that it, it unnecessarily intruded on the sovereignty of the main tribes um, because it required a specific process for how the tribes were going to select that individual for the recommendation. Um, and in particular could be viewed as inconsistent with the main implementing act um, and the protection for internal tribal matters for the Penobscot Nation and the Passamaquoddy tribe. So this language um, makes a, a, a change to it in that the tribes are to make a recommendation to the governor. Um, and, and then if there isn't a unanimous recommendation or if there is no recommendation made at all, um, then the governor will select a person that rotates amongst those four tribes. So it also provides a backstop in the event that there isn't a recommendation at all. Great, thank you. Are there any questions from committee members? Representative Hepler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Kimberly. Um, I'm also a member of, of DMR committee. And one of the things we talked about was whether um, the tribes would make more than one 
recommendation from which the governor could choose? Is that something that this, we did this a couple of weeks ago. So um, I'm just wondering what this bill would, this language would do. Um, so if the, this bill, if, if there was if there was more than one recommendation made, um, then this bill again kind of provides, I would say, a backstop where the governor would likely then choose amongst those two members, um, or the governor then would would switch to trying to appoint a member that rotates amongst the four tribes. But um, so it, it does provide sort of like some alternate language in the event that there's more than one recommendation made or there's no recommendation made at all. So if, if I can follow up, um, Senator Dill. So yeah. there's no requirement that they produce more than one name? No. OK. So Commissioner Camuso, was that kind of where you were coming from? I thought you had said two or three names that you would put forward to the governor and doing that in uh, collaboration with the tribes. Yes, yeah, Senator Dill, thank you. That was our request um, that we would work with the tribes and bring those uh, name or names forward uh, jointly to the governor's office. I, I also have a question that um, should a no nomination be put forward and the governor appoints somebody that would rotate, what is the term for that particular person? There's certainly some advantage to having this seat um, have the same duration that the other council seats have. And so there are a number of issues that come up and some history with the council is important. So I would be uncomfortable if that seat were gonna change on an annual basis as opposed to every three to six years. Um, you'll forgive me, um, I, I am not, I'm not, confident with how long members serve, um, but I don't think that this amendment changes any of those provisions. Okay, so it doesn't change. Thank you. It doesn't change the length, I think but it doesn't address yet whether it's just one name going forward or more than one name going forward. And Commissioner, where are you on that? Are you okay with working with um, the tribal council or what uh, whatever it would be called the, to uh, come up with um, just one name or would you prefer more than one name? Sure, that would be fine. There, there are certainly times when my recommendation to the governor is just one, one name, uh, particularly when someone's going to be reappointed. Um, I would, I, and I don't, I don't think, um, I don't think this addresses, I, we, I just would want to ensure that the, the person nominated has the same seat time term, the same term and is available for the same two, three year terms as our current council members are. Um, you know, in general, the, the way it works now is with the other seats um, as commissioner and as, as all commissioners do, you have a vision and a sort of a plan for the agency and where you want to go. So I interview people and, and talk about my goals and objectives for the agency and uh, how this seat um, plays into some of those goals and objectives. So I, I do like the opportunity to meet with potential uh, council members before they're appointed and make sure that we have a similar vision for uh, how we're going to interact and what sort of things we want to work on. But um, that, that was my only request there. So is a sentence needed in there, um, Commissioner, that basically says that uh, almost at the end of the yellow um, paragraph um, that the appointee is for up to two, three year terms. Is that the way it would be? Would you see it worded that way? Two, three is consecutive, I assume. Um, yes. Yep. And I, I guess I would just Say that the you know that the 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 seat is you know the terms are the same as the every other right. council seat. I mean we can do it so, either way, but just as long as you yeah we could just put the language of the you know the advisory council language in there you know yeah. a council right. member is eligible to serve up to two three year terms. Yeah, and that's consecutive terms. They can come back. Is that correct, or is it only two three year terms? Period. It's two three year terms, and then they have to step down. 
Right, but then they could come I'm back sure. after a, t a fashion and serve two more three-year terms, correct? Oh, if they're really vulnerable. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just saying. Yeah, I'm not sure that you've ever had it, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Representative Danny Martin. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, that's exactly what I was gonna suggest. Uh, uh, the current statute is uh, three-year terms, no more than two consecutive three-year terms, but in fact, they can in fact uh, come back after uh, a period. Okay. Oh, so I will, what, I, what I'm suggesting is exactly what the commissioner said to add that language in there, make it consistent with other advisory council members. All right. So John, do you kind of capture that adding a sentence in there? Yeah, the, um, I believe that language would already apply. I should just pull this up, make sure that we're all looking at the same thing. Um, can I do this? How do I, sh I'm no good at this. Okay, there. Can you see that? No. Okay. <laughs> well, in subsection two, it, it says the appointments are for terms of three years until a successor is appointed and qualified. A person may not serve more than two consecutive three-year terms. So I'm assuming that applies across the board to all members who, and would apply to this member as well. So I think that piece is covered. So you don't think it needs to be in here? So I, it's, in, I mean, we can certainly add further language to make it clear if there's a concern by the commission that, uh, but I, th I think, I think that language covers all the members. Okay. What it is, we'll, we'll wait to see whoever makes the motion, how they want to go, if they want to add that sentence in or what. Representative Newell, are you okay with what has been suggested to this point in by the AG's office? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I am. We did have the conversation with the Attorney General's office on, on Thursday in regards to this language on this bill as well as well as another bill in, an, in another committee. So yes, we are we are fine with this language. And it is my understanding that it, it didn't change um, what was being discussed as far as the term of the seats. Okay. Mr. Chair, may we move on to pass as amended? Okay. Move on to pass. Representative Okay, it's been seconded by Representative Hepler. Representative Danny Martin. No, no, I, I'm good. Uh, I was just going to make the motion. Uh, and I think John is correct. I just took a look at the entire statute and, and the language is clear. It, it would be applicable to, uh, to, the, uh, to the other members that we're adding. Okay, very good. And we don't need to add that sentence in. So, ought to pass as amended. Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, Linda, would you please call the roll? Yes, um, I'll start this time with uh, Representative John Martin. Yes, but uh, you can't see me for some reason. Oh, okay. Okay, so then uh, we have to wait on him. We'll come back to him. All Jump right. over to Peter Leifert if he's not frozen before he freezes again. I know, yes. I can, yeah, I can vote yes, no problem. Representative Leifert? No. No. Represent Representative you Mason? Yes. Representative Hepler. Yes. Senator Curry. Yes. Senator Black. Yes. Senator Dill. Yes. Representative Landry. Yes. Representative Terrio. Yes. Representative Danny Martin. Yes. Representative Ordway. Yes. Representative Alley? Yes. Representative Nedu? Yes. And uh, we still can't see Representative John Martin. Representative Martin, can you try to turn your camera on again? Are you there, Representative Martin? I am, but it says uh, you, can't, you can't start your video because the host has stopped it. But I vote yes. Well, we can't do that yet until we can figure out how to bring you back. Um, the host has not done anything. <laughs> um, I think we're just having some glitches today. Um, huh, I don't know what that, uh, yeah, that means. I don't either. Um, I, I, 
can we uh, take a second? There we go. There you are. I can see you, but we can't hear you. You can see me now. Yes. I can see you now. See, I guess you can. Yeah, I vote yes. You vote yes. Thank you. Okay. Then don't, that go away. don't go away, John Martin. I think we have to have you vote on another bill here in a second. Uh, um, Linda, what was the tally on this one? So that makes it 11 in favor and one against. Okay, so it's 11 to one. Ought to pass as amended. The bill passes, and that is LD um, 361, an act to establish a permanent appointment of a member of the Wabanaki tribes to the Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Advisory Committee. And before we go on, I will close the work session on LD361. Before we right. move on to other things, John Martin, we need to have you vote. Is that correct, Linda? That's correct. On uh, LD356, which was ought not to pass. That's the uh, seniors and persons with disabilities getting post permits without a lottery. Ought not to pass. Ought not to pass. Okay, so that makes it uh, 13 unanimous. And can I just ask um, the minority report on 361? I assume that uh, Representative Lyford is is ought not to pass. Hey, Senator Dill. Just a second, Representative Lyford. Is it ought not to pass on the minority report? No, I'd like to change my vote to yes. Oh, okay. While I'm in here. That's okay. what I was going to tell oh. you. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so that does make it unanimous then. Um, 13 ought to pass as amended. All right, great. Representative Newell. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say thank you to the committee for your consideration. You're most welcome and thank you for presenting the bill and being here this morning. Thank you, have a good day, everyone. You too. All right, now we move on to some uh, language review. This will be Rachel. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I would like to start with LD 142. Okay. Um, which is an act to give the Commissioner of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Rulemaking Authority to establish a bear season framework and bag limits. Um, as you may remember, um, when the uh, we fiscal note came back, the committee um, reconsidered their vote um, and wanted to move forward with amending LD 142 in order to remove the sections of the bill that related to the decrease in fees for um, bear hunting and bear trapping permits um, and to move that portion um, related to the decreased fees um, into LD10. Um, so I have language to come back to you, but there are also a few things of note um, that came up when drafting that I'd like to go over. I am gonna share the screen so we can all take a look and I'm gonna do my best to make this as clear as possible. Um, so um, I'm looking at a screen off to the side, so it might look a little funny to look away, but um, so as you can see um, here, um, this is the committee amendment to LD 142. So we're going to tackle these in, in LD 10 and 142 um, separately, but together. And I do have my comments off to the side for those that um, would like to kind of follow along by reading. Um, section three of LD 142 um, is the issuance of permits, uh, the issuance and permit fees. So when I began to draft the amendment, um, as I have presented it, I said we should pull section three out of LD 142. Um, but as I began to draft it, I realized that um, this phrase here, when the bag limit on bear is more than one, a bear hunting permit is required for each bear. This is the only place in LD 142 where that's referred to. And therefore, in order to move forward with the intent of LD 142, we don't want, we would not want to remove um, that language. Um, so um, in order to keep that portion, rather than striking all of section three, um, I would recommend leaving it as written, but remove um, only the portion that decreased the fee. So kind of returning that to as it's originally um, or currently written in statute. I will note that in doing that, if we proceed in the way the committee had voted, that this will create a conflict in law. 
So essentially LD142 and LD10 will both be amending the same section of law. Um, this can be resolved in an errors bill um, next session, but it is of note. Um, and if we um, look at how this is um, done in LD10, um, just so you can see what that would mean is um, when addressing the fees um, in LD10, we'd leave the rest of the um, section or um, excuse me, subsection um, as it's currently written in law and only change the fees. Um, that this can be resolved um, in an error bill. Um, I, I just, it's just of note to mention. And then um, <clears throat> I also have to admit that I failed to mention section 11 to the committee last time we were together. Um, section 11 also deals with fees, the trapping permit fee, which also was a reduction. Um, the committee did not vote on this, although um, I think our conversation around the fee, the intent was also to address it, but I did not bring it up. We only um, dealt with section three. Um, so if the committee would also like to um, adjust the fees for the bear trapping permit, um, we would also need to um, amend the bill in section 11. My recommendation, because the only thing being changed in LD142 to this portion is the fee, that we could just take section 11 out of the bill. And if the committee would like to change the fee that we would do it in LD10 where we're already addressing hunting and trapping permit fees. And then of the, on, just um, as on the last note, I had conversations with the department regarding this as I reached out to them just to make sure that I wasn't missing something here. And in those conversations, um, the department realized that the information they put forward for the fiscal note um, didn't take into account the increased uh, number of permits the department may um, issue as a result of that possible second permit. Um, and so they believe they have revised numbers um, for a fiscal note um, based on actually um, keeping the fee as originally written in LD142. I realize that's um, kind of two things, two big things. I'm happy to answer um, questions. And I know the, the department's also available as well. I'm not sure if it's easier if I stop sharing the screen or leave it up. I think um, we're okay at the moment. I can still see hands and stuff. So okay. Representative Terrio. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, can't we just remove the annual fee for each permit issue sentence and put that into 10? Hello? Um, I'm sorry. Sorry. That was oh. me thinking about it. Um, <laughs> I know okay. it's quiet. I couldn't, couldn't hear my yeah, plans. It was. Um, I am not sure if that's the, uh, the sort of the best way to move forward as this does talk about the fee as well. And I, I, I think we would still bring about the, the conflict um, by, by amending it in two different ways. Cause you do still need to address the, the permit um, fee. Oh. Um, Did I not answer your question? Uh, maybe I misunderstood your question. Well, I, I don't know. I'm, hey, I'm I'm grasping at straws here, anyways. I'm I'm just trying to make it so that we don't have a conflict in law. And if we we take in section three and take that sentence out, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm I'm just talking to myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I think we'd still end up with the conflict. Um, although, as I mentioned. Um, the, 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 we made, the department did pull some new numbers related to um, the fiscal note um, that um, might present a different situation. Other questions? Representative Danny Martin. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Rachel, uh, do we know what that revised financial impact is? Yes, we do. I, I have those numbers, but I'm also, um, I had extensive conversations with the department um, and um, so I'm happy to share, but I'm also happy to have them speak to that process, which. Um, no, 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 if you know, no, just, yes. just answer it if you know. The sure. Um, so after further review of the fiscal note for LD142, um, they realized they hadn't addressed that, um, the increase, the anticipated increase um, in bear hunting permit sales um, that would occur because of the availability of the second permit. So um and again, these are all approximations based off of best guesses, um, but 
They believe if the resident hunting permit fee was reduced to $10 as a proposed in the original bill, that sales would increase by approximately 35% um, due to a combination of the reduced fee and some hunters purchasing a second permit. Um, so they also anticipate that the non-resident bear hunting permit sales will increase by approximately 20% um, due to some hunters purchasing a second permit. Um, with a more modest 10% increase in the sale of resident bear trapping permits um, due to the reduced $10 fee. So they're um, projecting that increased sales of permits will result in approximately $4,990 in additional revenue to the department, um, despite the reduction in permit fees for residents. Um, and then they also ran the numbers um, based off of the amendment um, which is in front of you, um, but, but both for trapping and hunting. Um, and the $2 increase for non-residents, and that would be um, a projection of approximately $68,320 in additional revenue. Uh, if I may, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, yeah, with that in mind, a uh, question to anybody who can answer it, uh, John or, or Rachel, uh, do we, you know, this was my motion intentionally, I mean, it was done in the absence of, uh, of the Senate chair. I think you had to leave for a moment and just amazing what we can do in, the, in your absence, Mr. Chair. I thought of that too, so thanks. So the question would be, uh, do we have to take another vote on this? Um, I, I believe we would, depending on how the committee would like to move forward. Um, whether to move forward as the committee discussed, but because I did not mention section 11, I'm not sure actually how official that would have to be. I think it was the committee's intent. Um, but if we want, if the committee wanted to move forward with the um, $20 fee and the $2 increase for non-residents, um, we may, I'm not sure if we have to have an official vote, um, but we, I would certainly need the committee to okay um, that I also make that change under the trapping permit. Um, obviously, if I may, Mr. Chair, obviously this is a cleaner, uh, cleaner sheet here, and I, I, I would concur with Rachel's uh, suggestion. And I, I could go either way with the ten dollar or twenty dollars, whatever the committee decides. Well, I, I see in one place it says ten dollars, another place it says twenty. Uh, so in one forty-two, I think it says ten, in one and in ten it says twenty. Also, since section eleven was left out in the original bill. I think we need to reconsider that because I think that's a substantial change. So I think we should reconsider the vote on that to clarify that. But we'll see what the rest of the questions are and see where we go. Yeah. Uh, my, go, ahead. go ahead, Danny. Yeah, my, my motion was $10 at the time. So clearly, if we change the 10 to another number, it would have to the committee. That's absolutely. Yeah. Revote. Yeah. yeah. Representative Hepler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thanks for bearing with me and explaining all of this from last week. Um, given the, the conflict in law, couldn't we just put all the stuff that's in LD10 into LD142 and skip LD10? Well, I thought about this afterwards. Yeah, I think originally the reason it was done that way was to try to do away with the physical note anyway, because of the concern around the physical note. So that's why we brought back LD10. Again, I wasn't here, but I know it was brought back purposely because it had been a not not to pass and it was a bear bill. Um, so that's that's the reason why we are. So I think that does bear further discussion, no pun intended, um, to go ahead and, and, and see what, uh, um, what is the best way to handle this. And I'd go back to the commissioner since I think the department may have been partially involved with the discussion around or the suggestion around going to two bills anyway. So commissioner, your thoughts. Yes, thank you, Senator Dill um, and members of the committee. Again, I'm Judy Camuso, commissioner. And I think um, with the recalculation of the fiscal note, you could go back to the original uh, LD 142 as representative uh, Hepler recommended. And, you know, the department's goals in this uh, bill, as you know, um, was not to increase revenue rather than to increase people participating in the activity. And the, the whole purpose was to try and reduce the fees so that we could get, uh, generate some additional interest. We neglected to consider that the cost for the second permit will likely offset any um, reduction in fee. So 
I think Representative Hepler um, has a good approach. So is the $20, I mean, that's not reducing it a lot, going from 27 to 20. Um, do you think that that's okay. going to, go ahead. No, I think that will generate an additional 68,000 or so. Is that what Rachel said? I think the original reduction to 10, because folks would have to pay for the second permit, um, does offset the reduction. All right. Thank or you. brings it to about a $4,000 positive for us based on our estimates. All right, good. Uh, Senator Curry. It feels like we're in a place that we're ready to reconsider and 142. We're gonna to re yeah, we're gonna have to reconsider them both here in a second, but. I yeah, I, I just, I think we did all these gymnastics in order to not put a fiscal note in it. And, and now that we don't need it, I, I'd like to see us go back to the original. Right, so I think what we would bother to do is First, we'd reconsider 142, make sure the amendments there are correct. Then once we vote that in, I assume, then we'll reconsider 10 and vote it out. So uh, it ought not to pass. Would that be uh, what everybody's looking at? I see some thumbs ups and Representative Danny Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. C could we not uh, move to reconsider our motion whereby we uh, voted on LD 142 and LD 10? Do it in one motion. Sure. I, I, I suppose you can do it in one motion. It's, it's fine, but we'll just make sure when you say your motion to do 142 first, just so there's no um, confusion. Whatever works, Mr. Chair. So you're gonna, your your motion is to reconsider LD 142 followed by reconsidering LD 10. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Is there a second? I'll second. second that. Been seconded by Senator Curry. Just show of hands, all in favor? Unanimous. All right, moving back. 142. Um, reconsideration of this. So could I have a motion on this bill? Because it needs to have a whole different slot, I think, because if I understand it correctly, I wasn't here. But right now it says, $10, but it needs to be 20, correct? No, I see some no's and I see some yeses. If I may. So, go ahead. Um, I just, um, so uh, Commissioner Camusho let us know that um, given the revised fiscal note, their concern that the reduction in fees to $10 um, having uh, would hold up the bill on the appropriations table no longer exists. They believe that um, taking into account um, the second permit increased revenue that they're actually, um, they may end up seeing um, an increase of almost just almost $5,000. So they don't have that fiscal note concern. So um, if the committee wanted to move forward as LD 142 was originally written with a $10 um, fee, um, then there are actually no changes to LD 142 that would need to be um, made. Um, so no amendment would be necessary. If the committee wanted to move forward um, with the twenty dollars as um, decided last session, then we would need to move forward with that amendment. Thank Representative, you. Representative Danny Martin, Mr. Chair. So, what was the uh, recommendation of the commissioner's office, Commissioner Judy? Is it ten or twenty? Representative, yeah, we would recommend the the ten dollar uh, okay. fee, which was the original motion correct. by Representative yep. Martin last time, correct? Yes. So we're back to the original bill as amended. Because you must have amended it, Representative Martin. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, just to start a discussion, uh, I'll move uh, out to pass an LD 142. As amended. Is it as amended? Because you amended it last time. So, or is it straight? Uh, uh I, I don't I don't think we need an amendment if we're going to stick with ten dollars. Okay, I'm just asking. Since I wasn't here, I don't know what's going on here. Second. Okay, Rachel, you want to say something? No, I'll, only that um, Representative Barton is correct, and I do have the original bill um, right. available if anyone wanted to look. All right, so it's ought to pass on LD one forty two, and who seconded it? Was that Representative Mason? I didn't hear who seconded it. I'll second it. Lester Oddway, Representative Oddway had actually, sorry. 
All right, any further discussion? Seeing none, would you please call the roll? Linda. Yes, uh, starting with uh, Representative Lyford. I don't see him here. All right, I'll, I'll skip over him for the moment and go to Representative Mason. Yes. Representative Hepler. Yes. Representative, uh, sorry, Senator Curry. Yes. Senator Black. Yes. Senator Dill. Yes. Representative Landry. Yes. Representative Terrio. Yes. Representative Danny Martin. Mark Clerk has just tried to promote Senator Curry to representative. Yes. I get on a roll with the representatives. Uh, representative Ordway. Yes. Representative Alley. Yes. Representative Nedu. Yes. Representative John Martin. Yes. And I don't know if Representative Lyford is there or has stepped away. Uh, Representative Lyford, you there? Perhaps he just can't get back in or something. So okay. I'm here. Oh, he's here. <laughs> Can I see you? Uh, yes. 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 And the vote is yes. The vote is yes. Okay. Thank you. That makes it unanimous. 13 ought to pass. 13 all ought to pass on LD 142, an act to give the Commission of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife rulemaking authority to establish a bear season framework and bag limits. Thank you. Representative Martin. Mr. Chair, do we now have to move ought not to pass on LD 10, or have we done that? So, yeah, so we, we have to now because you had passed it last time. Right. I would move ought not to pass on LD 10. I'll second that. Seconded by Tim Terrio, Representative Terrio. Any discussion? Okay. Call the roll, please. We'll start at the other end with Representative John Martin. Yes. Representative Nadu. Yes. Representative Alley. Yes. Representative Ordway. Yes. Representative Danny Martin. Yes. Representative Terrio. Yes. Representative Landry. Yes. Senator Dill. Yes. Senator Black. Yes. Senator Curry. Yes. Representative Hepler. Yes. Representative Mason. Yes. Representative Lyford. Yes. And that yeah. is unanimous. 13 ought not to pass. Awesome. Did I miss? <sighs> what? Can't even say, can I miss anything? No. Yeah, this was the uh, LD10, which was the second half of the bear bill. It was ought to pass before, and we just rolled it all back into the first one. We didn't have to pull out the fees, um, but you had passed it last time. So this time we're just doing ought not to pass on it to get rid of it. It was strictly on bear fees, permit fees. So with that, we'll move on to further language review. LD223, Rachel? Uh, yes. Um, so LD223, um, an act to clarify Maine's fish and wildlife licensing and registration laws. Um, I brought a couple of things up during um, the bill analysis around some of the language changes. Um, and um, in addition, the committee um, voted um, or it was, I believe it was tabled, but um, uh, wanted to include um, a division of the fees, um, the increased reinstatement fee um, to have some of that portion of the fee for certain um, violations go to the landowner relations um, fund. Um, so I have that here. This does do a couple of things. Um, so it might be best to walk through it um, piece by piece. Um, and I'm gonna share the screen to- And before us. you do, Rachel, just a question for you. Yes. Um, since I think that was one of the bills that I wasn't here for either. Oh uh, yes. So so is this tabled? Is this an what what is what is the uh, position yes. of this bill in? It was tabled, um, and I was to come back with language fixes um, and uh, language around how to divide the funding. Okay, so then can I have a motion to take this off the table so we can discuss? It? So moved by Representative Martin, seconded by Representative Landry. All in favor? Just show your hands. Thank you. 
All right, now go ahead, Rachel. Okay, and I'm sorry, but I am also, um, for those of you that would like to have this um, not just shared on the screen, um, I've just sent you a copy by email. I know sometimes the links don't work in the chat box. And um, okay, so um, starting here with uh, section one of the bill, um, failure to pay fine and reinstatement fee. Um, I when the bill first came in front of me, um, there were some questions around the removal of this portion here that related to um, the courts. Um, this is something I wasn't sure if should be removed, um, but upon further legal review. Um, uh, my office is um, satisfied that that is um, acceptable to be removed. Um, but we did suggest um, keeping this portion here that um, defines the word fine, um, which is referenced above um, in, um, in this section. Um, so we're gonna restore that definition of fine um, from Title 14, Section 3141, Subsection 1, um, back in, just as it's referred to up here. Um, in addition, uh, for consistency across the statutes. Um, this phrase, if a license permit or registration is suspended, um, we wanted to make sure license permit and registration was consistent. Um, and so uh, as it was in um, section um, two under reinstatement fee, license permit or registration, we looked at a couple of the other statutes um, and it, um, it made sense to uh, bring the word permit in um, into the section here. Um, so we have the same consistency across um, the statute. Are there any questions? Uh, I, I, this does deal with a couple of different topics. So I think if, um, as we're sort of moving forward, if there are questions, um, kind of take them one at a time. So if there are any questions about this one. Any questions for Rachel now? All right. Um, that brings us uh, to section two of the bill, um, which was enacted to um, read reinstatement fees. So this is being added to, um, to the section. Um, you can see it referenced up here. Um, so in looking at this, um, there are a couple of things going on. First is um, we wanted to bring in, um, so individuals have to pay a reinstatement fee um, for um, having their license permit or registration suspended or revoked pursuant to this section or Title 14, Section 3142. And just for reference, that is um, contempt of court. So failure to pay your court fines is considered a um, contempt of court. Um, so that's what that is referring to um, there. And those um, are currently in statute. That is what's um, referenced here. So we um, brought this language down so that reinstatement <laughs> fees are for both. It makes clear that it a reinstatement fee um, for these um, suspensions or revocations um, is about both this section 10902 in Title 12 and also um, this section in Title 14. Um, and then per the committee's request, um, the committee wanted to see the increased um, fee um, for suspensions or revocations that were already occurring to be divided so $25, which was in current statute, would continue to go to the general fund. And that increase of $25 um, would go to the landowner relations fund established here in section 10265. For the new collection um, of reinstatement fees as, um, as a result of suspensions or revocations pursuant to this section, um, in Title 12, which are commissioner suspension or revo uh, revocations, that all $50 of the reinstatement fee um, would go to the Landowner Relations Fund. Um, so this was per the committee's request. Um, I, uh, there was, I think, a question during the work session around um, what, um, what currently, who, what, what kind of violations currently result in a suspension or revocation and um, the dollar amounts or how much um, is actually currently being paid that goes into the general fund. Um, and I believe the department was pulling some numbers around that if the committee um, is interested in, in knowing. Um, I think there was some concern that if all of the reinstatement fee, the $50 went to the landowner relations fund that this could impact the general fund 
And I believe that the department was looking into that um, to those numbers if the committee would like to hear more about that. Um, I don't have that information um, in front of me at the moment. I do have a question on that, which is yes. which is kind of where does it go now? The reinstatement fee goes now to the general fund, or is there a re I see or not, Commissioner? Could you do you know the answers to this? Yes, right now those reinstatement fees go to the general fund, and our estimate, if all of the fifty dollars uh, the reinstatement fee went to the landowner relations program, it would only be. Uh, $2,000 annually. So what was it? How much? I'm sorry, 50,000? 2,000. No, 2,000. Two, two. So not a significant concern. Not a significant amount. Okay. So as it's um, currently written, um, $25 of the reinstatement fee for a license, permit, or registration suspended or revoked pursuant to Title 14, Section 3142. Um, and $50 of the reinstatement fee for a license, permit, or registration suspended or revoked pursuant to this section, which is um, 10902 and Title 12, uh, must be deposited to the Landowner Relations Fund. So currently, um, reinstatement fees are collected pursuant to Title 14, Section 3142. Um, and so it's um, those dollars that were the committee was hesitant about impacting um, by moving away from the general fund and into the landowner relations. So it's drafted now to um, to represent that split, but only for those Title 14 okay. suspensions or revocations. Okay. Um, and that's going, I'm gonna jump um, down to a lower, lower section of the amendment as we are still talking about reinstatement fees. Um, so in um, reviewing the current statute, um, uh, Title 12, Section 10901, Subsection 4, also deals with a reinstatement fee um, that was not in the original uh, bill. Um, and so these are related, these um, reinstatement fees um, and suspensions and revocation, or excuse me, suspensions are related to Title 19-A, Section 2201. That's child custody payments, support payments. Um, and so currently uh, the reinstatement fee it was $25. Um, so the desire was to make it consistent across the board. Um, and this, they, this one was missing um, from the original uh, bill. So to increase it to $50 and to do that same split as with the Title 14 um, and have $25 of this reinstatement fee go to the Landowner Relations Fund and the 25 that was already um, in existence continuing to go to the general fund. And then adding the word permit for consistency. Are there any questions about that? I don't see any. Okay. All right. So that um, brings us to the end of reinstatement fees. And that brings us to um, section three of the original bill um, around um, <clears throat> uh, trapping licenses and the eligibility for trapping licenses. So the original bill was making a change to B and C um, related to the word, uh, so getting rid of the word resident and instead referring to person. Um, at, and these are uh, essentially junior uh, trappers or children. So B is a, a person 10 years of age or older and under 16 years of age uh, being eligible to purchase a junior trapping license. And um, C is a person under 10 does not need a license. Um, so in changing the word to person rather than resident, um, a person could mean a resident, a non-resident who is a citizen of the United States and a non-resident who is not a citizen of the United States. And there is a prohibition on trapping for non-residents who are not citizens of the United States. And in changing in the word resident to person, the, it was inadvertently changing the rules for non-resident, non-citizens. It was opening up the trapping universe for those individuals under 16 to trap anything. But in current statute, and as the prohibition, if you are a non-resident, non-citizen, you may only trap beaver and you may only trap it pursuant to section 12259 subsection three. And that is, a um, if Mainers can trap beaver in your home province or country, then you can do so here. Um, so we wanted to make sure that the universe wasn't opening up. That was an error in, in how it was put forward. Um, so the answer to that was to add, as you can see here in yellow, 
um, the prohibition to the sections B and C. Um, so if a person is a non-resident, not a citizen of the United States, the license issued under this paragraph authorizes the person only to trap beaver pursuant to section 12259 subsection three. So a person under 10, or excuse me, a person 10 years of age and older and under 16 can still purchase the license, but they can only trap according to those rules. And the same is true for um, a, 10, a person under 10 doesn't need a license, but they can still only trap if they, according to those rules, if they are a non-resident and not a citizen. And that, um, that change meant that we could cons essentially consolidate um, D and E. So a non-resident 16 years of age or older is eligible to purchase a non-resident adult trapping lice and then provided that if the person is not a citizen of the United States, the license authorizes the person only to trap beaver pursuant to section 12259 subsection three, and we can get rid of E. Okay, I don't see any questions either. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's eligibility. Um, and that's really just to make sure everything kind of conforms and we're not accidentally opening up the sphere for, for youth and creating a legal conflict. Um, so, um, and then, as I pointed out in section six, uh, related to um, snowmobile registrations, um, it used the word annual in a place where they were actually referring to all types of registrations, both annual as well as three, 10, and seasonal. So we struck the word annual and um, from those portions and then added the word annual below where we're actually talking about the annual registrations um, that are valid for one year. And then in that conversation, uh, these, the change here is actually made to be consistent with the language in the ATV registration section. So I went to review the ATV registration section um, and that also has the error with the use of the word annual. So um, in order to clean up um, and have conformity, we addressed the word annual here um, in the ATV section as well. Um, so deleting the word annual where um, ATVs have uh, they also have, I think it's a 10 day registration um, as well as a, um, an annual one. So removing the word annual and adding it here where it is actually referring to the year long registration. And those, uh, so those are the changes that I brought back both based on um, my uh, notes from the bill analysis and the addition of the split of fees um, between the Landowner Relations Fund and the General Fund for the reinstatements. Happy to answer other questions or discuss the process at this time. Are there any other questions? Uh, Representative Danny Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the motion on LD 223 was ought to pass as amended. Since we're now doing a language review, a uh, question to Rachel, Have is there anything here that you've uh, shown us that's inconsistent with the motion of ought to pass as amended? Um, I don't believe so. I'm, I'll have to apologize. My note was the, um, that it was tabled to bring this back with the amended language as suggested. It's, um, I'm not sure if I am in error there, um, but no, uh, I, my direction, my understanding was to both come back with language fixes, um, which these are all things I mentioned and to, um, have the amended language around the division of the funding. Um, you wanted some draft language on what that would look like. So that's what I've provided um, I stand here. Correct. I stand corrected, Rachel. You're absolutely correct. Uh, we've now removed it off the table. So do we need a motion to move this forward, Mr. Chair? Uh, yeah, but before we do, can we go back to that last section? Uh, yes, the, uh, the registrations. Yes. Yes. If, I, if uh, I'm looking, for, yeah, right here. Yeah. Under number three? Yes. Your last sentence in yellow. Yeah, uh, the last sentence. Yes. There's something wrong with that sentence. An annual issuance. Issuance until June 31st? <laughs> uh, uh, I didn't retype this. So um, <laughs> let me go see where I copy and pasted it from. And let's see if that's... Um, let me... I'm gonna stop sharing to do that so you guys don't have to watch me navigate. Um, Just thought I'd point that out. I feel like that, yeah, no, let me go check to see if that's um, just a copy and error or. 
if well, that's actually how it's, it's written. It's already in statute. Um, that uh, we can go until June 31st. We can always blame it on the typist. <laughs> um, just give me a, a moment. Either way, we have to change it for our bill, but. Uh, I believe that that is in statute. I believe it's part of one of our amendment bills that's still coming up. That, that's, that was a longstanding typo. And so that is a longstanding typo, June 31st? Okay. You caught that like an English teacher. <laughs> yeah, that was done after I left. <laughs> All your excuses here, folks. So. <laughs> hmm. Uh, yep, uh, Colonel Scott's is correct. It's in current statute is um, June 31st. And I have to admit, I, um, I never mastered the song about the days of the month and the month. So I'm just, I, I didn't catch it. And I was not an English teacher. <laughs> so we need to change that. Uh, we certainly can address that here. Yes, it would yes, make sense. Yes, we're doing here, so. Absolutely. Someone else has to address the rest of it at some point, which must be us also as a committee. But I'll leave that to Rachel and John to figure out how we address that at some other point. All right, so back to you. Uh, is that the end of your, oops, uh, uh, Commissioner? Thank you, Senator. I think um, Deputy Commissioner Tim Peabody would just like to talk about the um, some of the language around where the fees are going, if possible. You can simplify that a little bit. Sure. Deputy Commissioner Peabody, you're on. Thank you, Senator Dill. I, when I read the amended language, I appreciated what the, the committee was trying to negate a fiscal note and to uh, put money into the landowner relations fund. Uh, the way that it's currently written up in the amendment presented by Rachel, under section two, um, that's uh, subsection 11, that's actually a zero fiscal note um, when it refers back to the uh, title 14, 31, 42. Uh, the court, that's court ordered uh, revocation of a license for failure to pay fine. And that's, uh, we, we have not got any court orders for suspension. So it's essentially zero. And then um, under section seven of the amendment, the suspension of license for the DHHS, that's only about $2,000 a year, um, which is a negligible. And I just think the complexity in the language here, I just would like the committee's thoughts on that whether you could just put all the money into the landowner relations fund, it'd only be a $2,000 impact on the general fund. Just to make it simpler. Representative John Martin, I have a question for you. When, you know, when we always say these little negligible things on the general fund, it's 2000 here, 2000 there. What does that really mean when we get to the end of a bill like this? Still goes on the appropriations table, but it, it won't be a problem getting off the table. Okay, that was my question. I figured it went there, and my concern is I didn't want it to die there for a couple thousand dollars. So, all right, thank you. So, uh, Deputy Commissioner Peabody, is there a language change there that needs to be done? Is that what I heard you say, or is it just okay as it is? I think you could put the entire amount to the landowner relations fund okay. and avoid this, that split language. I think it would just make it a lot cleaner going down the road for people to understand the reasoning behind it. All right. Rachel, did you catch that, get that uh, change? I can certainly make that change if the committee would like. Uh, committee, I see nodding yes. Yep, you want that change. Okay, was it uh, Representative Danny Martin that was, were you making an emotion there, Representative Martin? Yes, that was in the form of a motion, yes. Okay, so that moved that ought to pass as amended. Was there a second? I don't know if it was a second. Representative, where is second? 
So it's moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Linda, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Um, again, I'll start with Representative John Martin. Yes. Representative Nadu. Yes. Representative Alley. Yes. Representative Ordway. Yes. Representative Danny Martin. Yes. Representative Terrio. Yes. Representative Landry. Yes. yes. Christmas. This friggin' thing. <laughs> Senator Dill. Yes. Senator Black. Yes. Senator Curry. Has he left us? Senator Curry, I don't see him. No, he may have left us. Okay. Uh, Representative Hepler. Yes. Representative Mason. Yes. Representative Lyford. Oh, goodness. He's, I think he's enjoying Christmas at the moment. So. <laughs> he's there, but frozen. Oh, goodness. The issues today. Um, and now I don't see him any longer. Well, we have 11 um, in favor of ought to pass as amended. One, we're not sure where he is. <laughs> no. He's back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Representative Lyford votes yes, so that makes it unanimous. 13 ought to pass as amended. Okay, so on LD 223, an act to clarify Maine's fish and wildlife licensing and registration laws ought to pass as amended 13 to 0, it passes. Okay. I would say that was 1201 absent. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. I, I apologize. So that, yes, Senator Curry is absent. So it is 12. With one absent, so it's 1201. It's Passes. Uh, any else to come? Anything else to come before us, Rachel or John? Um, um, I don't have. I do not have anything else to bring um, forward to the committee today. Okay. If there's nothing else, going to have a motion to adjourn. So and Robert Alley, Representative Alley, seconded by Representative Terrio. All in favor, just wave at me. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. See you Wednesday. Bye, all. Well, I'm on the committee. I, I know. <laughs> Linda? Yes. Did I miss any vote? No, you came back in just in time. Let me just go back through and double check to be certain, but I think you're all set. No, we got you for 10. 142 is all set. 309 is all set. 356 is all set and 361. And then 223 is, yeah, we caught you right at the end. So now it looks like you are all set, despite all the issues. <laughs> looks like you're frozen again.